Thank you, Professor Jalali. Um, I should explain that uh, Aryan Sharifi has very kindly stepped in to fill the place in the program that Mr. Masood was to have occupied. He's had to return for a family reason. So, uh, Aryan, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Jeffrey. Well, yesterday I uh, focused mainly on the security aspect of the transition and uh, and today, I mean, I don't know what Mr. Masood was going to talk about here, but I thought I would just elaborate on some of the points that I raised uh, yesterday in my presentation, uh, which is specifically on the security aspect. Although it's difficult to be, uh, uh, diff make a divide between security issues and economic issues and, and other social and, and other issues that uh, exist in Afghanistan, but I will try and make this. Um, what I said yesterday and what I'm going to say today is specifically my own personal views on, 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 on the security aspect of the transition and how I basically perceive the situation and think about the future as an Afghan. Um, from, from where I see it, uh, we are facing with basically two time periods, if you will. Uh, the first time period would be a short to medium term and then the second time period would be sort of the more, the longer term period. And I'm going to talk based on that. In the short to the medium term, we know that the transition is happening. And it should happen, as uh, Ms. Kofi uh, mentioned earlier, very rightfully. Um, from an Afghan point of view, from a myself point of view, from the entire Afghanistan, of course, I don't represent anyone but myself. Uh, there are at least three reasons for why uh, the transition in 2014 should happen. The first reason is that we have had over 10 years by now uh, of, of the international military involvement in Afghanistan. And this, these 10 years have brought us to where we are right now. Uh, but now it looks like we are stuck in the status quo and we're not really making a lot of progress either in the security or the political or in economic aspects. Uh, so this status quo has to change in my view. Um, we are, where are we now? What is the status quo? The status quo is that we, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are stuck with a weak government, we are stuck with a corrupt government, we are stuck with security forces that are not as strong as they should have been. Uh, we are stuck with a lot of warlords uh, holding very powerful positions in the country. Uh, we are stuck with drug trafficking and we are stuck with a host of other problems. Now, this trend has to somehow be altered, uh, hopefully for the better. And in order to change this, some fundamental changes have to come to, uh, come to place. Uh, and I believe that the transition would be an opportunity uh, to, to bring about that change. The second reason why I think the transition should take place in 2014 is that the international community seems to be exhausted about Afghanistan. Uh, there's absolutely no question about uh, the, the very decreased levels of political will in the capitals of these, all of these uh, NATO and other countries that are involved in Afghanistan. So now, the more, in my, in my view, the more we push this status quo, the more tired they will become. And we might end up with a situation where they are too tired to even uh, continue a partial presence in Afghanistan for a longer period of time. So in order, in my view, to prevent the situation like the United States got out of Vietnam, got too tired uh, to get out of Vietnam, I think now is the time to make that transition and, and, and basically prevent that real complete exhaustion. Uh, the reasons, I mean, I, I, I gave some numbers yesterday. Uh, the exhaustion mainly come both uh, from, from monetary, from financial expenses, and from human expenses. In terms of the financial expenses, it is roughly about $150 billion expenditure only on the presence of the international military forces in Afghanistan, not to think about the, the, the other expenses they have, uh, which is the reconstruction, the construction, and other, other stuff. If this is reduced to a, to a large extent, then they might be able to continue it for a longer period of time, and that 
even partial prison for a longer period of time could dearly help us as Africans to adjust to the situation. And the third reason why I think the transition should happen in 2014 is that it would give the Afghans, us, a sense of ownership of our country. Having worked in rather lower ranks in the government, uh, I did not have a sense of ownership when I worked in the government. Uh, I was surrounded by four uh, uh, international advisors, nice people, colleagues, and my office. So I would not feel the responsibility that I would if they were not on my side. So it would, with the transition, the Afghan security forces would actually get a better sense of ownership and would feel a, a, a heavier sense of responsibility. And hopefully that sense of responsibility and ownership would eventually lead them to become competent and to be able to provide security for uh, the country. Now, with this inevitable and necessary transition happening, what do we have in terms of our security forces? Well, there is no doubt that the level of competency and the level of quality of the Afghan security forces, be it the army or the, the police, or even the intelligence, if you can count them as security forces, is really not where they should have been, and it's really not where we could expect it to be. But what can we do? Transition is happening, and so uh, we are left with these flaws. Are we going to sit back and say, okay, the army is not working and the police is not working and, and we're not able to take responsibility for ourselves and give up hopes or try to sort of look into the positive signs. And I personally tend to look into the positive signs. And I do think that there are quite a lot of positive signs to be built upon and, 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 and would give a sense of hope for us as Afghans that we eventually could make it. <coughs> one of the reasons why, one of the signs, one of the positive signs is that Personally, I observe a sort of strong and growing sense of, of being a national army, sort of a nationhood within the army, within the ANA. Whereas in the past, uh, it was mainly either a factional army or, 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 or not an army at all, or a political army, if you will, in the, during the, uh, uh, the communist government. Right now, the sense of sort of a, a one hood in the army is growing. This question was actually raised by uh, an observer yesterday, and I briefly addressed that. But if you if you look at how the army units actually the, the, the personnel in the units perceive each other, this issue of uh, ethnicity and, uh, and tribal affiliation and uh, even political affiliation and political background is kind of leading out, and a sense of uh, one hood is emerging. And it's becoming more and more strong. Let me give you uh, an example as an anecdote. It was uh, rather uh, an unpleasant incident. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was an incident in Kabul, a small one, uh, in the 15th district of Kabul, where there was a clash between uh, a group of army guys and a group of police guys. Now, it's a bad incident. It's not a positive, not positive. It's a clash. We don't want that to happen. But what what I got out of that was that the army people stu stuck together as an army, and the police guys stuck together as police. They fought each other. Now, I'm going to see what they find in that, and, and I hope that with the transfer of responsibility and the more we go, that sense of ownership and that sense of onehood would actually increase. Yeah. The other sign, the other positive sign, is that the uh, training programs are, are, are going on more vigorously than ever uh, in the past year or so. I mean, if you, if you think about the level of the training for the, for the army and for the police, it has been vastly increased uh, since this deadline, withdrawal deadline of 2014 came into discussions. And with this, we are hoping that uh, in terms of quality and in terms of quantity, we will have, by 2014, we will have at least a strong enough security forces that could help preserve the regime in the shorter term, uh, short to the medium term, and I'll talk about the longer term later. Uh, and, and it's not to forget that we are not actually in 2014 right now. We are just beginning 2012, and 2014 could mean anything or any time from January 1st, 2014 to December 31st or 30th, 2014. So if you 
if you think of the end of 2014, we have three more years. And I do believe that three more years is quite a lot of time to prepare ourselves if, if you're not prepared. And that preparation can only happen if you at least have some hopes for being prepared. And um, apart from the training, as now the, the National Army is taking sort of more and more of a leading role in conducting military operation, in an, this, this leading role in and of, a, of, of itself is part of the training. Uh, and I think the more it sort of goes forward that way, the better they would, they would finally uh, become. There was a question from one of the uh, observers, uh, this, this was off the, off the set, uh, as to whether Afghanistan would actually need a larger and stronger army or a larger and stronger police. And in my view, we need to, we need to sort of distinguish between the responsibilities of the police forces from the responsibility of the army. At the moment, it's sort of mixed. At the moment, we're using the police forces for counterinsurgency and, and, and counterterrorist operations. And in my view, uh, that really is not the job of the police. The job of the police is to ensure, uh, ensure security in the cities, to find crime, uh, pursue criminal networks, and that sort of stuff. It, it basically implement the, the, the law and the rule of law. Law enforcement is basically the job of the police. Whereas the, it's the army that has the responsibility to go out and fight the insurgents and, and defend the, the nation against the insurgents or even uh, foreign adversary. So in that regard, I think we do need a stronger army. Uh, but for the time being, until we get to the point where we could actually afford having a stronger and larger army, we don't really need that because we hopefully we can rely on the assistance, at least strategic assistance, of our international partners. Same with those with the equipment, providing the equipment for the army. One of the biggest flaws that is, that is uh, uh, basically pronounced for the uh, Afghan security forces is that they're not well equipped. Yes, of course that's true. They are lacking uh, heavy military equipment. They are lacking an air force. They are completely lacking any radar capacity. They are lacking air, air left capacity, all kinds of that stuff. But, but for the past year or so, that sort of the efforts at, at, at bringing in more and more and better equipment for the army and the police has also increased. I think it was only a few months ago when the United States committed another $18 billion uh, for the next two years to, to, to provide equipment for the Afghan National Army. And uh, only three to four days ago, I was driving in the car in Kabul and I hear on the news that uh, the first round of uh, Russian-made helicopters that were purchased by the United States for the Afghan National Army uh, arrived in Kabul. So, I mean, there are signs that slowly and slowly they are getting the equipment that they would need. And as I mentioned yesterday, they are not expected to conduct real, symmetrical, large warfare, at least in the small to medium, medium term time, uh, time period. Uh, what, what the Afghan security forces would be expected to do at this time period would to fight insurgents, counterinsurgency, counterterrorists, very swift, small, light units to go in and out of missions and provide that kind of defensive capabilities against such kind of attacks. And for that, I don't really think that we would need, the Afghan army would actually need a lot of, uh, 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 of really large uh, military equipment. The same goes with the training. I mean, yes, of course, I'm not a military person, so if, if, uh, if somebody else is, is, and, you know, excuse my ignorance on that, but uh, generally, I don't think that there is a lot of necessity to train for years and years every foot soldier that would need in the army or in the police. Maybe for the police a little bit more, but for the army not so much. Pretty much by this time, all of Afghans know how to take up a gun and shoot. And, and that's really what it comes to uh, in, the, in, in the battle. Even in the past armies during the uh, communist government, when, when we had a much stronger army, than, than now, and it was of course based on uh, compulsory military service. I don't think many of those those people who were just you know brought into the army to do their military service would actually see a lot of training, at least more training than the, the, the army guys are, are getting today. So uh, but these are some of the some of the positive signs, and I just wanted to highlight two more. I, I know the two minutes, and uh, I will uh, I will conclude in that. Um, 
In terms of the transition, I think by the end of, from what I was told by the Minister of Defense, was that by the end of uh, this month, the second round of transition would be completed. And the second round of transition would actually include about 50% of Afghan population, not the territory, but the population. Now, yes, they might have gone with the easiest regions, uh, but still 50% of the population to have come under the responsibility of the Afghan security forces is a big thing. I mean, we cannot really ignore that. And think about the levels of, of insurgent attacks based on a NATO and Afghan Ministry of Defense uh, study. There have been 25% reduction this year in insurgent attacks than last year at this time period. Now, I, I remember there was a sort of contradiction by a report coming from UNAMA, but the UNAMA report, we have to realize that it was basically based on all kinds of threats, which includes all kinds of petty uh, criminal activities as well, where we, we are really talking here about insurgency. So, anyway, I'm, I'm just going to say a few more sentences about the sort of the longer term, because I mentioned that at the beginning. Uh, now, I am hopeful as an Afghan, and I hope that I'm right, uh, that for the short to the medium time, uh, time period, our regime, our political regime will survive. We will not let, we will not have the Taliban come back and establish the type of government they did in the 90s. We don't like that, we despise that, we're not going to let that happen, hopefully. And we do not want, and I think, and I hope that our, our security forces are at least able, at least able to prevent the jihadi groups from, from basically looting the country once again and, and killing thousands and thousands of people and destroying the country totally once again. And in my view, those are the two main threats that are coming for the short to the medium term. Uh, for the long term, I'm just going to say there's going to be a lot of work needed on all different types of uh, on different aspects, but in my view, uh, I'm just going to, if I got it correctly, build a little bit more on one uh, on one point that Professor Giovanni just mentioned, which was basically uh, the, um, the the monopolization of the use of force by the government. And for me, the essence of any government is the monopoly over the use of force. And until we have that in Afghanistan, there is it's just impossible that we would ever get good governance that you will ever curb corruption or ever solve all of these sort of pro other problems that we have. So for the long term, all of these, in my view, somehow the GLD groups must be disbanded, their arms must be collected, and somebody, Mr. X or Mr. Y, just because they have, you know, 10,000 armed men should not become the minister of this or the minister of that, uh, simply because of that. And I conclude in that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker in this uh, wrap-up session, and then we'll go to a brief period, chanting a brief period of questions and discussion before the final ceremonies. Um, I'll invite uh, Mr. Miyake to address this. Thank, Thank you very much. You know, my job is very easy to be a last speaker, and after two days, good presentation and answer questions, and also especially this panel. Uh, the job is easy because I would like to thank ISAS for the uh, invitation. And also organized this conference, which is shown in our team, and provided good hospitality, and also the logistic issue, and so many others. And also visiting Singapore for the first time, which was very interesting for us, and I learned a lot from this conference in so many ways. And the second is to kind of little bit summarize what my colleagues uh, just said before. Uh, if we just wait for India and Pakistan to solve their problem, or the US and Iran solve their problems, or China and India solve their problems, or US and Russia solve their problems, and then Afghanistan will be a stable country. I think this might be a dream. It will not happen in our lifetime. Uh, and so that was, we should not think about that that much, what will happen in the rest of the world. Yes, it has an impact on us, but we are should take more responsibility to bring stability to the country and to rebuild our country. Maybe uh, some cannot, you know, if the last 10 years, or even I said 30 years, uh, so many men is coming, many came to Afghanistan, but we didn't have a peace. We didn't have a reconstruction the way we wanted. And still, you know, always we want more and more. So that was, we take the responsibility. That is the more important place. When we meaning is the Afghan government and the people and everybody. Uh, the second issue is that 
Uh, we are trying to find a technical solution for a political problem in Afghanistan. So the technical solution is that increase the number of forces, decrease, they have more equipment or more money. These are technical issues. But you cannot solve a political problem on these issues. So then what is the political problem in Afghanistan is not only that just to reach out to the Taliban, that is the one portion of the political solution in Afghanistan. But the rest is depend on good governance, uh, inclusive political process in the country, transparency in the uh, governance system in Afghanistan. Uh, i just give you a little example because my boss, Minister Jalali, is here. Uh, but he gave me a hard time when I was his duty. But he gave us a full authority, whatever he could sign, we could make that signature. Doesn't need constitution changes. Just by delegate authority. Doesn't need a constitution changes. And we give that authority to our directors. And my department, which was uh, now IDG, plus several other departments were also included, uh, we had uh, three advisors, and that advisor was not able to help me. And I asked Mr. Jalali to just not renew their contracts. And we didn't renew that. But most of the directors, so I didn't have a single advisor in the whole uh, the department which I work for that. Uh, but our directors, they were my best advisors. And they helped me to just to do all, all the day-to-day -day work and most of the reform, like civil services and others, uh, they were implemented, they implemented by them, you know, not by the advisors there. This is what I said is yesterday, change of constitution or law or regulation, institution and capacity. These are excuses to really delay the process or everything. You know? The election I gave you in 1960s or in the 60s, when we had an election in Afghanistan, they could announce the result of the election on the same night in the 60s you know, in Afghanistan. But in that time, there was no communication, there was no wireless telephone, there was no internet. You know, they did it very well because the modern just said, okay. The election of Afghanistan will not happen because election is not one election. The way it is designed, the constitution of Afghanistan, we have election every year in the country. Uh, because we have a district election, village elections, uh, provincial, national elections, municipalities and all. This is not possible because you have to count the election. But you have to design the way of the election process. It can be affordable for Afghanistan and sustainable and it will be continued. Because if there is a gap happens in one election, for example, if election in 2014 does not happen, delayed for whatever reasons, so meaning whatever is spent on election process and political process in the country for the last 10 years, it is missed, you know. So that is uh, more important, uh, the governance aspect of it and participation in the ARMA. And why I just said 2014 is very important, because status quo is not accepted, neither for the ARMAs, not for our regions, not for the international community, or also not sustainable. Because whatever we just said, because the politics we see it in the world, uh, or financial situation is happening in the US and Europe and others, those billions of dollars will not come to Afghanistan, no matter whatever they give a promise, you know. Uh, but the question is, we have to design ourselves that we can sustain. And that 2014, which has happened, the election in the US, election in Afghanistan, transition has happened. So it's very important. So if the political transition has happened, so it will create a momentum. I just said it's momentum, not an ideal situation for good governance, rules of law, and accountability. And that, we have to think about that. The rest is increase, decrease the forces, this all level of threats, there are different kind of calculation, for example, like you mentioned, I was in the UN. Uh, the internal threat in Afghanistan, because this is an insurgency in Afghanistan. So insurgency is, I uh, have different elements. Taliban, Al-Qaeda, war laws, drug laws, bad governance and corruption, so many other parts of all this is part of the insurgency. We have to deal with all of that. So our calculation was in 2008, when I was with the UN, 80% of our problems are internal problem, but 20% was the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and others. But if internal condition is ready, so of course the internal factor is more important. So if internal condition is not ready, I give example yesterday in 1973, the same group, 
Okay, but uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud, the Afghani and others, supported trend by Pakistan, a group by Pakistan, they sent it for Afghanistan, but they couldn't do anything. They couldn't destabilize the country. So good friends make a good neighbors. You know that's uh, something. So we have to build ourselves. We cannot wait for the rest of the world. And if our neighbors see that the stability is coming, they have a relative stability in Afghanistan, then the government can be accountable and people trust the government. So I'm sure the, our neighbors uh, will also change their calculus. You know? But if they see, no, there's no stability in horizon and everybody's leaving, there will be a civil war, option B will be, they will keep option B all the time. You know? So that was the reason we have to go for option A, have to bring stability to Afghanistan, and Afghanistan should take it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for really insightful presentations. And just listening to the anecdotally as much as the analysis was fascinating for someone who's an observer, but by no means a specialist in this area. I'm sure others in the audience will have found the same as I have. Um, we're going to take until five past five for a general discussion, and then we'll have to, uh, Shanti will wind up. We need to finish by 5.15. So we've got about uh, 10 or 12 minutes for general discussion. Um, do any of the Afghan uh, delegates first? I've got uh, Surya as the first off the track after the other Afghan speakers or other speakers and the panels have had a chance. Yes, would you like to begin? And could you go to the microphone, please? Yeah. I think I'm shorter than. <laughs> I said the last. Yeah. Uh, in the current uh, context of uh, insecurity, spread of insecurity uh, in Afghanistan, as the terrorists are more relying on terrorist activities, uh, uh, I think no mention, no mention of the uh, intelligence of Afghanistan uh, was, was mentioned or given uh, throughout all of the discussions. Uh, I think countering uh, terrorism is the job of mainly, particularly it's not only countering terrorism, it's also countering uh, the intelligence. So, uh, although we don't have figures that uh, how strong our uh, intelligence uh, department would be in Afghanistan, uh, but uh, it's sort of uh, 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 a concern that I wanted to raise that any of our Afghan panelists if, if, uh, could elaborate on that. Thank you very much. Um, Wilton, yes, would you like to just follow the question? Would you rather have them collected? We can certainly collect some more. Are there other points then that, uh, uh, Surya, then I think you're, you're up in the meantime. I'm Surya from ISAS. But it's a question addressed to the minister, the former minister in particular. Will you rule out altogether the old-fashioned idea of a United Nations Peace Force for the interim period after the exit of the US forces and before the Afghans can really feel confident to take over? Thank you. Well, one more. One more, perhaps, before we... Uh, uh, no, but in fact, I saw a hand down here. The, uh, up there. No, my question is very simple, sir. Uh, this is with regard to the terms, uh, terms of reference. I think we have a defective uh, terms of reference. And the question here is not just about regime change, but identity change. Because you, if you understand the Afghanistan, the AFG, the Russian doesn't remain there. Only the A remains to be an G, and that's a ghost factor. And that, that, that's the, the, the invisible uh, hands and whatever not. So if the Afghan is not going to do the own internal rectification, this is resolution 2012, already past 10 days. So unless you are willing to accept the fact that internal problems, that external forces is, 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 not, is no point. Pointing fingers is no use. Now the question here, if you keep on saying that see no evil, say no evil, talk no evil, think no evil, everything is the evil is that the cheese remains to be there. Is there a question yes. coming? No, 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 to you that are you are you you are fantastic. You guys are fantastic, but also fanatic. Can you be realistic? <laughs> uh, 
Well, it's uh, the panel of the universe order, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, Would you like to make uh, so, so one thing. Uh, no, 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 Thank you very much for the question regarding the capabilities of the Afghan uh, National Department of Security. Uh, I think uh, that department has uh, a, a, a good capability, a good habits, and uh, uh, there is a need for improving their professionalism, diversifying them, and, uh, and their investment and reform is ongoing in that organization as well. But as all uh, uh, the organization or the security intelligence organization, uh, always, they are missing from the security sector reform because of the sensitivity, and nobody is talking about that. And often, after the in the conflict and after the conflict, they are also neglected because of the digitalization, <coughs> because nobody thinks that where all those agents and you know, operators will go, and sometimes they will transform them, so they treat the criminals uh, uh, in the hands of the different uh, uh, bodies and powerful people. Uh, so for that reason, uh, it's a very valid question. It's, attention has to be paid to that. It should be, uh, uh, it should be more investment is required in order to, uh, to make that organization as a more capable, professional, uh, and as, a, as an eye in the ear of the, of the state in order to ensure the right of every citizen in Afghanistan. And I think that is the goal. We are moving toward that, and they have the best uh, kind of uh, uh, people in their hands. Regarding the United Nations, I should just uh, say that we don't want to go to square one. We're already in the, the third square. If we return back to there, I think it will be the waste of time. Uh, uh, yes, the UN can play a role. There is the international forces is in Afghanistan because of the resolution of the United UN Security Council. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we have to invest more on Afghans in an institution. And I think that that would be Afghans from trusting their own national and institutions. And as I, the, the, the colleagues mentioned before, uh, that uh, there is capabilities, there is differences, but there is the wealth of Afghanistan is our diversity. Don't take it that we are uh, competing, we are criticizing, but this, that is part of the bargaining. You are also bargaining when in a political sin, in every democracy, they will say that how I can position myself to be prepared for the next phase. So there is a bargaining, but everyone in this current political system, they will not go to violence. They have an interest, they have investment, they have a custom with a new way of life, and I think that is, that is the positive side of the people who transform themselves from being uh, in, the, in, the, in the freedom movement for fighting against the, the Soviet Union, then there was the time of the warlords and things like that, and then they, they become politicians, and they, they, they have to go to the time. But a second generation is coming up, and there is a different generation that, that has a different mentality. And I think uh, uh, they, they, they know that how to enjoy the life all the time, they will not move for that. Professor Jalan? Uh, yes, let me take this question about the intelligence. You know, in matter of principles, uh, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism is fought by intelligence and police. Uh, the army has a supporting role because in both cases, you have to win the support of the people. In order to win the support of you, you have to protect people. You have to uh, become uh, the, the arm of law, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, intelligence in Afghanistan comes a very, very big baggage. From the time it actually became an instrument of pressure uh, uh, in the country, and instead of supporting and uh, protecting people, they were protecting governments from people. And uh, instead of spying on the enemy, they were spying on their own people. And I believe that that baggage is still there, unfortunately. And uh, the other problem that in all intelligence agencies are there, not only in Afghanistan, they do not share information, they do not share intelligence, even in very advanced countries. And that actually has a, has a uh, you know, uh, negative impact on fighting uh, <coughs> terrorism, fighting uh, insurgency, and fighting crime. <coughs> 
you know, the 9-11, we did the report of the commission of 9-11 and see even in the advanced country like the United States, how that lack of sharing information or taking information or intelligence information seriously actually caused that disaster. In, in Afghanistan, it's the same way. In my case, and when I was in the Minister of Interior, I tried very hard to bring some kind of a kind of a cooperation between intelligence, which because for us, national security, I mean, uh, uh, NDS, National Director of Security, there was intelligence in the Minister of Defense, there was intelligence in the Minister of Interior, there were uh, in, in, uh, intelligence in, in every, every province, even individuals, you know, figures had their own intelligence uh, structure. But we were unable to bring the kind of uh, cooperation that the, the, the information sharing will, will, will result from that. So therefore, yes, intelligence is very important. That's the, the, the basic means of fighting terrorism, fighting insurgency. But unfortunately in Afghanistan, we have a long way to make that intelligence as a, as a, as a, as a kind of a professional uh, you know, uh, force that can uh, you know, contribute to all that, that, that. There is improvement, there's no doubt about it. But still, it comes with a baggage. Um, Mr. Sheriff, did you have something to add on? I could just add a few lines and uh, about the, the, the also on, on the counterinsurgency operation. In my view, and this is something I actually uh, learned from my former boss who just walked in, Dr. Gunaratna there. He uses this for counterterrorism, and I think it also fits into counterinsurgency operations. Uh, I mean, I, I believe that counterinsurgency operations need to be fought on three levels. There needs to be anti-insurgency, there needs to be uh, uh, strategic counterinsurgency, and there needs to be tactical counterinsurgency. And what I mean by that is, uh, please correct me if I, was, if I took your points wrong, uh, Dr. Um, anti-insurgency, in my view, mainly has to do with protecting yourself and the population against insurgent attacks, and uh, strategic counterinsurgency has to do a lot with, uh, with, with, uh, with strategic communication, basically, uh, basically damaging the environment for the recruitment of the insurgents and for the operations of the insurgents on a strategic level, generally. And then tactical counterinsurgency, of course, has to do with, with, with fighting the insurgents on the ground. And, and intelligence, of course, is a huge part of pretty much all of these two levels. Thank you. I think with that, we should begin to wind up because we've gone over our a lot of time already and we've had, I think, 36 very intensive hours. Please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. For <laughs> Um, uh, Shanti, will you take the microphone? Thank you, panelists. It's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Shanti D'Souza, Research Fellow of ISS, to deliver the concluding remarks of the workshop. Dr. Shanti. Thank you, Hemo. I think all of you will agree with me that it's not easy to conclude a panel which seems to be the opening panel now. And this is Afghanistan. I've been studying Afghanistan for almost one decade, and still I feel I'm still studying it. And these are the complexities of Afghanistan. The reason we had this workshop was, one, to give Afghans the platform themselves. So this was an Afghan workshop meant for Afghans to talk about what they see as real issues as the transition occurs and basically prepare themselves for transition to be effective. So therein, whatever you see is the internal transition process which has been occurring. And this is not a blame game which is occurring in the long sea. So the good point is we have a debate going in Afghanistan, and this is a positive sign. So I think we should give a huge round of applause for the Afghan participants. <laughs> for those of you who are con confounded by the complexities, Pratibha has been kind to put few points in the board. You have a few takeaway points, but this is just the beginning of the process. Singapore and Institute of South Asian Studies is the first forum that Afghans had to do this. And it's a first of sorts, first for this year, and first before any of the international conferences are going to take place. And deliberately, the charge is workshop. It's not a conference, because we're not looking at conference-oriented solutions. We are looking at an ongoing process to help Afghans to take the lead of their own affairs, to take matters in their own hands. And we've heard this enough, an n number of times in conferences, 
that this is an Afghan-led process, an Afghan-owned process. I no one really knows what this Afghan-led and owned process is up. So this is a forum where Afghans have talked on a wide-ranging issues from the security, from the political, the economic, and we have a broad spectrum of speakers. Uh, we had speakers from the field giving a very micro perspective. We have a macro level perspective. We have perspectives from the policy makers, from the media, from experts from Afghanistan, and that is very important. So I think this is a positive sign and a beginning of something which is actually Afghan. And for that, I think I'd like to thank the audience for having stayed along with this entire process and the deliberations, which will be fruitful. As we come out with papers, we will be having working papers being published very soon, being put on the ISAC's website. And those of you who are interested, please have a look because this will be policy-oriented papers. For people who are interested in the academic work, we will be publishing a book out of this. And this would be much ahead of the Tokyo and the Chicago summit. Uh, we have addressed the gaps and what we are trying to look at is after the bomb, there were certain gaps which are not really looked at. So the papers will be looking at the gaps which are not addressed the issues which needed to be dealt with before the upcoming conferences, and also looking and building on the narrative of opportunity. And that is to counter the whole anxiety of the withdrawal has created for Afghans. Uh, we know that the international community, community is going to stay there, but in what form? Will it be enabling Afghans? And these are the questions which we have tried to pose. So having said that, and having looked at the various layers of the complexities, we also try to get the regional solution to this problem. And as you know, regional solution remains very illicit. Even getting the regional participants here was not possible because the Indian and the Pakistani uh, participants couldn't make it for various reasons. So that speaks about the regional solution. <coughs> we also had participants from the US coming 8,000 miles plus and not even getting five minutes more. And this is, and this is one more problem with Afghanistan because everyone's short of time. Everyone wants quick fix solution and rushed answers to to problems which actually need time. And you don't fight counterinsurgency in quick time. Counterinsurgency basically means you have to have time, you have to have patience, and you have to believe in the local forces. And these are the local people who are living their lives there, who are actually having and bringing to us the sign of hope that Afghanistan is ready for change. So this is the message that ISAS would like to give. And this has not been possible as an individual effort, but it has been a team effort. I would like to thank Director Professor Tantayong, uh, Ambassador Pele, Chairman of the Institute, for having given this opportunity and the platform to carry out something so big and so important and more importantly, timely. I'd also like to thank the admin team. And again, it's a women-led team. We have, we have Jacqueline, Gloria, <laughs> and we have the things for Johnson, but we, we did put up, we did make the men work better. So that is what we will talk about the admin team. A special word of thanks to all, all the chairpersons who actually pitched in very well and set the tone. A special word of thanks to Dr. Narayan, Professor Rajamwan, Professor Abhin Jeffrey, Dr. Iftika Chaudhary, Professor Muni. Uh, you made this a valuable contribution. And last but not the least, for all the participants who have come from far and abroad and to the audience in Singapore for having stayed and being interested in looking at this as a cross-cultural learning experience. That's what Institute of South Asian Studies is. It's about understanding areas which are far-fetched and are difficult to understand, but bridging across the huge divide and bringing to the platform what is important today is the basic human connection. With that, I would like to wish you all a happy new year and thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the workshop on behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies. I thank you all for your participation, especially our speakers from Afghanistan, the United States, and the region. Hope you have a very good evening.